Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 215 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Thanks first to Text Expander for sponsoring our show. Communicate smarter with Text Expander. Gather, perfect, and share your knowledge. Recall your best words instantly and repeatedly. Learn more at textexpander.com forward slash podcast. And we'd also like to thank ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit servenow.com to learn more. In our last episode, we discussed spring cleaning for your personal data. In this episode of the podcast, we return to our LinkedIn Connections contest from a couple of episodes and announce the results, our winner, and what everyone learned. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, you just said it, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mall Report, we will indeed be wrapping up our big LinkedIn contest with our special guests, Julie Tolek and Lawrence Coletti. We'll be discussing the results from the contest, what we learned, and what this might tell us about LinkedIn in general. And as usual, we're going to finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. But first up, our LinkedIn contest results. We have talked many times about LinkedIn in this podcast. And although I will always tease Dennis that it's the third most popular social network, he will always remind me that it's the most important social network for lawyers to be using, which I will grudgingly agree with. Dennis, where do you want to start? Well, let's introduce our special guests, Julie Tolick and Lawrence Coletti. I want everyone to introduce themselves, including you, Tom, first by reading their current LinkedIn headline and then maybe telling us if they changed that headline during the contest. That will get everyone thinking about how others see them on LinkedIn. Tom, do you want to start? Yep. So what my uh, what my LinkedIn uh, says, it lists me as information governance slash privacy consultant, SIP which is a certified information privacy professional slash E, that means Europe, technology speaker and writer, author, podcaster, and tech blogger. And yes, I did change it during the course of the contest because I wanted to attract a certain a certain audience. And I found that the people that I was interested in attracting kind of kept the same types of things in their titles too. And so when you see an invitation with that level of detail, then I thought it would be more likely to get an acceptance. Julie, how about you? Mine says, firearms compliance and criminal law and family law, founder and solo attorney at Think Pink Law, associate at Skylark Law and Mediation PC. And I also changed mine during the contest to add the criminal law part because I am trying to take more criminal law cases and I've added it to my practice. So I figured now would be a good time to update my headline since we were in the midst of poking around LinkedIn every day. And Lawrence, how about you? Well, mine still says executive producer at Legal Talk Network. So I went kind of the opposite strategy. Less is more. And I actually updated mine a little bit. So during the last month. So now I'm calling myself a legal tech and innovation advisor, an infotech fintech lawyer, a professional speaker, author, podcaster, and adjunct professor. So just doing a little bit of tweaking, as Tom and Julie noticed, that you can kind of tailor your message to see what response you get or to open up some new areas. So to our audience, we recommend that you go back to our earlier episode that kicked off the contest to get some background on the contest. A little background on the contest idea. I believe that many people underestimate the value of quantity of LinkedIn connections and the value of weak connections. So how many people that you don't really know that well, but might be a way for you to reach out to to other people that you have in, in common. So we started with the following numbers of connections for our contestants. Tom, 1,315. Lawrence, 1,630. 
and Julie 587. So before we get to today's numbers and determine our winner, let's remember what everyone's original goal was and whether that changed during the contest. Julie, what was your original goal and did that change over the last month or so? Yeah, I mean, my original goal, I think, was mainly numbers focused and to try and add as many people as possible. But I started thinking about being more open to the idea of adding people that I didn't know because that was kind of one of my challenges or turnoffs for myself of using LinkedIn is because I felt I needed to know everybody already that I was adding. So my goal was to be more open-minded and do more searches for specific types of industries where there are people that I would like to get to know. Interesting. How about you, Lawrence? So as we discussed on the last show, you know, my, what I want, what I hired LinkedIn to do was to, I wanted to use it as currency to book more shows. And, uh, you know, I do think I kind of expanded that a little bit. I wanted to, to use it to kind of expand our social media reach. I also wanted to learn a little bit more about uh, media on this round. And so um, I kind of had a broad-based approach when we initially had uh, began the contest. And then I kind of had to get, become more focused because my time became much more limited. So I kind of focused in two primary areas. I focused, uh, one was antitrust because that was an area of law that I wanted to have uh, a little bit more connections with. And then the other one was just media. So legal media and then regular media, just because we're, uh, we're engaging in some new campaigns and I wanted to uh, get to know the, the industry a little bit more. Interesting. How about you, Tom? So my original goal was that I wanted to find more individuals in my field of business, in information governance and in privacy, data privacy and data protection. And as I will talk more about in Lessons Learned in the next segment of the podcast, that goal was harder to get to than I expected. It was not as easy to accomplish as I expected. And so I'm just going to be blatantly honest and say that uh, at some point I just switched to quantity and not care about the quality of my contacts. I just started clicking names and sending out invites. And the goal here was to win. So I was all about the winning at one point. I knew that would get turned into that. So All right, let's go to the results. So although I wasn't a participant in the contest because I have way more connections than everyone else in in my own techniques, I did predict that I would add about 200 new connections in the ordinary course of events during the course of the contest. And the actual number I added from where we started was 214, which is a pretty good job of predicting by me. So let's go to the numbers. How many first degree LinkedIn connections do you have today? And do you think you have the winning number? Tom, let's let you go first. As of today, the number of LinkedIn connections I have is 1,916, which is an addition of 601 new connections since we began the contest. I have no idea whether I won the contest. Wow. Julie, how about you? I'm pretty sure I did not win the contest because I only went up to 655. Okay. And Lawrence? I am also predicting that I did not win. I was able to grow about 10%, but uh, the top end number here is 1,793. So I think that that actually means, Tom, let's let you do the calculation. That means the winner is who? That means that I'm the winner with 601. Yep. Sorry. I was stunned by the victory there. Um, It looks like the strategy of just clicking uh, just madly and impulsively pays off and ends up in a winning of the contest. And that's good because there's probably you, the one thing I know about you, Tom, is that you really wanted to win this contest. So I'm very proud of you. It's not so much that I wanted to win, but you... You asked at the end of the last podcast why we would all win. And I said, well, it's because I always win on this podcast. And so I guess I'm just living up to the inevitability of this podcast. And that's all I'll say about that. And so the best thing is that you uh, you actually got more than I did, too, which would have been embarrassing if you hadn't. But no, I think that's good growth in, in numbers, Tom. That's 50 percent for you. I mean, Lawrence, that's, you know, a significant number, 10 percent. Uh, Julie up more than 10 percent. So I think those are great results. So congratulations, Tom, of course. Um, we want to hear from our listeners who played the game at home. Did you do better than our contestants? Next, up, we'll talk about the lessons our contestants learned and tips that they have for you after this break from our sponsors. 
Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screened process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. Text Expander helps you communicate smarter. You get home from an event where you've met some potential clients. You create a Text Expander snippet with a follow-up message. Use fill-in fields for the contact name and custom topic. Quickly produce personalized emails to everyone by expanding and filling in your snippet. Share your snippet with colleagues and everyone gets done faster. Visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast for 20% off your first year. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. So let's talk about the lessons learned in the contest. What surprised you the most and what are the big lessons that you learned? Tom, you're the winner, so we'll let you go first. All right. And I have a lot of lessons learned. And these are lessons and gripes and just observations that came out of this whole contest. I think the first observation is, is that it's impossible to get a thousand in a month the right way without quitting your day job or without significantly modifying your day job. Just can't be done. So I gave up on that early on because to be thoughtful about it, you really have to spend some time and think about it. I found that LinkedIn does not make it easy to connect within the groups that you're in. The, the interface is really difficult. I'll use the example. I tried to connect with people within my privacy group and it kept switching up the names. I would find names repeating in the list. And I thought I was just making my way through the list, but it would keep repeating them. So it is not a friendly way to identify people that you haven't connect with. So there's some shortcomings that LinkedIn has. Also, if you have a connection request out to someone, LinkedIn doesn't tell you that there's a connection request out unless you go to their individual profile. So I found myself clicking multiple times on people's profile without realizing that I'd already sent them a connection. I found that as a vendor, because my company is more a vendor. We're not a law practice. I'm, I'm not practicing as a lawyer. As a vendor, it's hard to get contacts without having people think you're trying to get business from them. I felt really nervous about sending certain contact requests out to people because I would be looking as trying to get business. And I don't, it would feel different for me if I was a lawyer than as a pure vendor in this way. So that affected the way that I approached the whole thing. You also have to account for no response from people. I, even though I got 600 contacts, I still have 385 invitations that are outstanding that no one has responded to. And I, I don't know if it's because they don't use LinkedIn or they just don't pay attention or what's going on. Some responses I got back within seconds, but some, like, like I said, a whole lot that are just still out there. I will say that um, Text Expander is an awesome way to send out invites uh, or requests for connection. When I was sending it out to my privacy people or information governance people, I created a little stock message and I was able to just plug it in very quickly instead of typing all those individual things out. And then finally, my one observation at one point in time, one of our podcast listeners suggested that, uh, Tom, you've got 7,000 Twitter followers. Why don't you broadcast out there and see if your Twitter followers will connect with you on LinkedIn? Well, I am here to report that Twitter is the worst social network out there, period, because I, I did send it out. And out of that, I sent it out twice, I think. And out of that, I got two whole contacts from Twitter. So I'm here to report, Dennis, that even though it is LinkedIn is the third most popular social network, I think Twitter is just a lousy social network for trying to uh, engage with people and get them to actually do things that you want. So those are my random lessons learned. It was a very interesting experience. I will talk a little bit more about how we might change things in the future. I would add to the point you were making that I think that when you want to add a large number, that your motivation is really, really matters. So if you are looking for a job, especially if you're looking for a job suddenly, or you're moving geography, or you want to launch something new, I think you're going to be more motivated to put the time and work in. There are also, you may go more to the professional tools as well, which might help you. But, but I think that motivation is a, is a big factor when you, when you try to add a lot of people in a short period of time. Julie, how, what lessons did you learn? I was actually surprised how willingly people accepted my request. I guess I assumed everybody was kind of like I am and, you know, like, who is this person? I don't know if I want to, to accept them. But 
I was surprised at the number of people that accepted and actually how friendly they were after in, you know, a few follow-up conversations that I had. Part of my practice includes building relationships with local law enforcement and federal law enforcement. So usually when an attorney is reaching out to law enforcement, there's a barrier there that needs to be broken before they realize that I'm reaching out on friendly matters instead of opposing matters. So I did reach out to some law enforcement and I was pleasantly surprised that they were willing to connect with me and, and start those conversations that way. That was pretty cool. So Julie, it seemed like you took a really targeted approach. Did you try the people you may know or were you just kind of really thoughtful about specific people that you sent invitations to? It was a little bit of both. So first I tried just, I'm going to click on everyone um, and, and see who accepts my request because I was focusing on the numbers. And I thought, well, if I'm going to spend time doing this, then I should do something, you know, that's maybe more productive that I can really use. And at that point, I think something popped up in the people you may know, and it was uh, law enforcement that was, we had a, another mutual law enforcement connection in common. And so that's kind of where I got that idea. And I think, you know, the more that new law enforcement connections saw my other connections that we had in common, I think that built my credibility with the other law enforcement officers as well. So I think it kind of, you know, it builds on itself that way. Yeah, that's cool. Lars, lessons for you? You know, I was actually very surprised because, uh, like I said, you know, right after the contest began, my availability of time really dropped. And so I kind of had to focus on what I knew and kind of focus on what I thought mattered. And so you know, I didn't do the premium job hunter account. I didn't focus on groups and I didn't alter my profile strength, nor did I write any articles, which we had talked about on the last episode. But one thing I was able to do was uh, parcel off just a little bit of time here and there. So I did this primarily by mobile. And so I didn't do any custom outreach messages or anything like that. So one of the uh, little gems I was able to uh, deploy, thanks to you, uh, Dennis, was I did focus on kind of the the built-in LinkedIn algorithm. And so I kind of just decided because I couldn't do the broad-based attack like Tom did, I was only able to kind of focus in two areas. So I focus on antitrust and media because those are the two areas that I really wanted to expand my, my knowledge and reach into. And so what I discovered over time was that no need for a message, but, you know, start with, uh, you know, do one and then the other on a different day because the algorithm seems to kind of perfect itself after you make you know several requests it starts to customize the next inbound uh, network connections you know the suggested connections and so I was able to actually build quite a bit in there and uh, I'll say this uh, even though there wasn't a lot of time I would consider the contacts I made quality contacts because it's certainly and I you know I'm not going to reveal who they are uh, just because of professional courtesy but I was able to reach out to some uh, members of the media that I thought were definitely out of my reach kind of deploying this active of just doing, you know, media one day or do it for two days and then switch back to antitrust for the next couple of days. Yeah, I think that's great. It's, sometimes you realize that you're more interesting to other people than you expect. And that's kind of like a nice reinforcement loop that can happen in LinkedIn. So I want to get like great connection stories or opportunities, especially the contest generated for you. And, and Julie, I, I think what you found when reaching out to law enforcement is actually a great connection story. But are there there are other stories or maybe some opportunities that came to you during the course of the contest as you were adding people? Not really opportunities, but I this is a, I have another great connection story. I guess somebody who listened to our first podcast with uh, when we announced the contest actually reached out to me and she said, "I want to connect with you to help you win." So I thought that was really nice. Okay. Lawrence, what about you? I mean, you were trying to get more people to interview on shows. Did that work out for you? You know, I think it'll come out in the future. I mean, definitely the the context that we build, I think, will add to our ability to attract not just guests, but hosts in the future. I think that there's some room there. But I think my biggest takeaway from this was that, you know, a lot of people complain, especially attorneys and other professionals, that they don't have time to do it. And what I found was because my time was limited, you know, I was able to parcel off little bits of time. I learned how to make it work for me. And so what I discovered was while waiting in line at the airport or, you know, I was waiting for somebody at a restaurant or something like that, you know, I would do five minutes here and there, but uh, it becomes a pretty effective practice. So I think for me, having to adjust the tactics and working with uh, the restraints that I had taught me how to be more efficient. So that was kind of my big takeaway. So I think that's, that's my story for this one. And Tom? So I have no great new connection stories or opportunities, but I have two anecdotes and this is kind of where I become the angry old man out on the yard telling people to get off my lawn because I got a number of 
requests following connections for me to buy real estate or list my house or begin uh, people not even paying attention to my profile and saying that um, I can help your law firm make millions of dollars in income if you just follow our marketing or whatever techniques that we have. But people who viewed it purely as a sales opportunity, and I began to get lots of those communications, which was not great. And then the only, I guess, fun connection story, which actually hasn't come to light yet, is is that under the people you may know, one day suddenly I saw the name of Rachel Lindsay, who you may recognize was the bachelorette last year. Uh, She's a lawyer in Dallas. She works for the law firm that actually broke off from my old firm. So I, I know her firm. I don't know her. But I thought, great, I can be friends with the bachelorette. And she has not accepted my invitation yet. And I'm uh, a little disappointed in that, but uh, uh, we'll see what happens. Clearly, she doesn't know who you are and how important you are. Yeah. So let's kind of wrap things up and say, if I had to pin you down and say, what what are your best tips that you would share for the audience when they're looking to add either just more LinkedIn connections in general or to add a lot of connections? What would be what your advice that you would give them? Lawrence? You know, I would say uh, my takeaway from this was focus. And so I do believe that the broad-based tactic works. And that's what I used to do is uh, I would uh, reach out to kind of random people or people I kind of knew or we shared an industry or shared a trade, didn't necessarily know them. And I would do that. That was my my first kind of approach. But I discovered the value of focusing in on one particular category. So I think for attorneys, if there's a particular area of law that you'd like to have a deeper connection with, stay in that vein for a while and kind of work those connections. I LinkedIn is a very effective tool for trade turning in new results. And I, and I think that you'll be very happy with that. Tom? I agree with Lawrence. I am still skeptical of the quantity over quality. I think that's a time will tell type of lesson. We'll have to see what happens. I don't think that a month and a half is enough time to figure out whether there's a benefit to that. But I think that looking at a specific group that you want to target and then going after them specifically for a period of time and then seeing how that algorithm changes in the people you may know, because what happened to me was the people you may know algorithm did change, but it changed in a way that I did not expect and that I did not want to connect with. And so uh, I think the other lesson learned would be that I would change uh, my focus on who I was looking at and see if I could get the people you may know algorithm to change in a better way in the future, but make it more targeted. I would be doing less quantity over quality in my case. Okay. And Julie? I definitely agree with Lawrence and Tom. I want to kind of backtrack and I thought of a a gripe, but I'd like to add to kind of piggyback that with a tip so you can avoid my gripe or so people can avoid my gripe. I was kind of bummed that on the app, when you request people, you cannot add a custom message. I really feel that like a little custom message about why you're reaching out or if you met them somewhere before helps kind of break the ice if somebody doesn't know you or doesn't know why you're reaching out to them. So I would suggest not using your mobile apps, but using your computer more often if you can, so you can actually include those personalized messages when you're trying to connect to people. Yeah, that's a common, this has been an issue, a negative that people have had for quite a while with the app. So that's, that is a, a very good point. And I want to add one thing, because uh, based on what Tom said about using Twitter. So when Tom said that he sent out an invitation for people to connect with him on LinkedIn, on Twitter, it doesn't surprise me he got a small result. So what I've found is that you kind of reverse that. So that if you have people who follow you on Twitter, who who just look really interesting to you that you can send uh, an invitation to them right away because typically you see that the same day so they're aware that they've just followed you and in that case i do use the mobile app because i don't think it's really necessary to send a personal message because they know they followed you and your response is to say yeah, it's great that you followed me but let's up it a little bit and saying that let's connect on linkedin as well and so that i found is a, a more effective way of using twitter so you can kind of screen and it's sometimes can be a way that because you realize there are people kind of interested in what you're talking about that will surprise you so that's the tip that i would have and one that i, I I use uh, recently. So let's wrap things up. Tom, do you want to get the contact info from our guests? Sure. So thanks, Julie and Lawrence, for uh, joining us on the podcast. Thanks for being part of the competition. I think we all got a lot out of it. Um, Let's start with uh, Julie and then Lawrence. Um, Where can listeners find you and get in touch with you if they want to learn more or connect with you? Sure. You can find me at thinkpinklaw.com or email me at julie at thinkpinklaw.com. And if you basically Google Think Pink Law, you'll find me everywhere. 
Lawrence? Well, you can find me at uh, LegalTalkNetwork.com. Uh, in terms of my social media profiles, it's Lawrence Coletti on LinkedIn. And Lawrence, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E-E-S-Q, short for Esquire, on Twitter. And Lawrence, of course, is also known as the hardest working man in legal show business. So it may take him a little while to get back to you, but he wants to hear from you. And I encourage all our listeners to send connection requests to all of us on the podcast and, and to reach out to people on, on LinkedIn. Now it's time for our parting shots, that one tip website or observation you use the second this podcast ends. And we've uh, talked to our guests to stick around and uh, play along today. So, Julie, what's your parting shot? Well, this month is National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month, which is actually federally recognized. And I suffer from migraines, and I have a lot of people close to me that do as well. There's a new FDA-approved drug that was approved last month. It's the first of its kind. It's called Amovig. I don't know much about it, but I know that my stepmom is going to begin using it. And um, I would just encourage people that suffer from migraines to do some research and See if there's something out there for them. Yeah, that's great. I know that the people I know who have migraines, I think suffer is exactly the right word. So it's good that there's there may be something new for them. Lawrence, what about you? Well, uh, recently we've had a couple busy quarters here at Legal Talk Network. And, you know, just the travel schedule has been a little bit higher than normal. And I think the last almost 10 weeks I've been home about a week. And it has reminded me of the value of my favorite app of all time. And that is Evernote. And the reason that value is, uh, is reminded is that I've been on some flights, a lot of flights lately, and the Wi-Fi on United, and I'm uh, reaching out to United. I hope you guys can fix that because I love flying with you guys, but your Wi-Fi is uh, not so bueno. But anyway, uh, when the Wi-Fi goes out, we lose connection. And so I've been kind of reminded as I've gone back to Evernote, the value of that, being able to use that offline, and then the, just the instant sync ability that you don't lose work and you can kind of continue on. Even when um, some of the long flights when my, uh, when my laptop has run out of battery power, I can continue working on my mobile device. So that's that's tremendous uh, add-on for me. Thank you guys. Hat tip to uh, Evernote. You guys are definitely my favorite app. And I will echo that uh, Wi-Fi on almost every airline I fly is miserable. So a uh, shout out to all the airlines to up your game on the Wi-Fi front. I'm getting ready to go on vacation. And um, I have gotten to the point now where I don't obviously bring a camera anymore to take pictures. I, like everybody else, take pictures with my phone. But I find that uh, sometimes it's hard to take those great shots of, of something far away. And zooming in with your phone really pixelates it a lot more. It just is that the phone isn't designed to have that kind of the digital zoom is just not as as good as the zoom you can get in a regular camera. So this time I'm taking a new tool along with me. It's called the Moment Tele Lens from Moment. And it is a lens that you clip on to your phone. And you actually, the one downside is I'm going to have to use a different case because the case allows you to clip it on. But you clip it on and it turns your 1x zoom into a 2x zoom, which automatically makes everything closer. You can then use the digital zoom a little bit. It still gets a little fuzzy, but it's so much better. I've tried it out just at home and it allows me to take close up pictures from farther away than I expected. I'm hoping that this has a good result on my, uh, on my travel photos. It's the Moment Telelens, it's $89 from uh, moment.com. And that could be really worth the time. I still remember the time when I was at Lake Tahoe and saw bears feeding on salmon in the little river there and uh, it was too far away. So I had these great blurry pictures where I said, hey, that that brown area there is the bear. So very disappointing. So tele, the, having a telephoto lens could be a good thing. So I want to mention again, Allison Shields and I wrote a, an article on LinkedIn connections and adding a lot of them. You can find it by going to either Allison Shields profile or my profile and looking in our under our articles. And the other thing I wanted to suggest people read comes from a blog called safe-t.com. And the title of the post is called Law Firm Data is Catnip for Hackers. And it talks about how hackers are targeting the data that law firms hold and has a list of things that uh, law firms have not bothered to do. A lot of it's just updating software, but a very useful article that I recommend to everyone. All right. A lot of good tips this week. Um, looking forward to, to, to more. That wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Ma Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please reach out to us on LinkedIn. Or remember, we love getting questions from you that we can feature on our B segment. Uh, leave us a voicemail at 720 
720-441-6820. I'll say that again. It's 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. And you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network. And, and nobody mentioned the other technique you can use, which I call strip mining. So you just go to Tom's thing and you go through his connections. You just start inviting them all. You know, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I should have thought of that. <laughs>